Hello and welcome to our virtual event, Bioprocess Next Leadership Summit and Expo 2022. We are kicking off today with a live interview between Daniela Cramp from Thermo Fisher Scientific and former FDA Commissioner, Dr. Scott Gottlieb. Daniela, who is Senior Vice President and President of the Bioproduction Business at Thermo Fisher, will interview Scott to learn more about the evolving opportunities in the biomanufacturing market. Daniela's experience spans the healthcare system from dealing with complex hospitals and health systems to working with physician practices, retail health, and at-home patients. She holds a bachelor's degree from the University of California, Riverside, and an MBA from University of California, Irvine. Scott is a physician and served as the 23rd commissioner of the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. Scott's work focuses on advancing public health through developing and implementing innovative approaches to improving medical outcomes, reshaping healthcare delivery, and expanding consumer choice and safety. He serves on the board of Pfizer and Illumina, is a resident <clears throat> fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, a partner at the venture capital firm New Enterprise Associates, and a CNBC contributor. Scott is also the author of the New York Times bestselling book, Uncontrolled COVID-19 Crushed Us and How We Can Defeat the Next Pandemic. This live interview will highlight his perspective on lessons learned from the pandemic and its impact on the biotech industry today and in the future. Before we begin, I'd like to encourage you to engage with us. You can submit questions at any time during the interview. Simply type them into the Q&A box and click send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the conversation. Please help me welcome Dr. Scott Gottlieb and Danielle Cramp. Thank you, Molly. And Scott, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. So last year, we were still in the middle of this pandemic when we spoke, and the big topics were around vaccine distribution and global disparities there, our very rapid regulatory clearance of these vaccines, and, and how we were going to really start to vaccinate the population. Now that we seem to be entering an endemic phase, we want to focus the conversation today on the lessons learned and the path forward beyond the pandemic period. So to get our conversation started today, I'd like to ask you, you know, looking at the current market situation from your perspective, how do you think the recovery phase is going as it relates to the pharmaceutical industry outside of COVID-19? And moving from vaccines to therapeutics, how do you see that evolution at this point? Hey, look, I don't think that the um, the pandemic had as dramatic of an impact on the pharmaceutical sector as many feared at the outset. And there was a lot of concern that there would be dislocations in the supply chain that would create drug shortages, particularly since a lot of the starting with chemicals for a lot of API was made in, uh, in China and Wuhan in particular. And I think that there was a lot of concern that uh, clinical trials would be disrupted and be hard to start new clinical trials. And there definitely was some impact on ongoing clinical development, clinical trials, but a lot of companies were able to make modifications to those trials to keep them going. A lot of companies were able to continue to enroll and start new clinical trials and saying the pandemic, adopting some new tools for doing that, um, reliance on, you know, site based instead of site based radios, reliance on data collected at home, shipping drug to patients, so they could self administer it under, um, you know, witnessed uh, telehealth visits, uh, using real world evidence to supplement missing data in clinical trials, things like that, a lot of clinical trial innovation that had been percolating for a while, I think allowed things to continue. So you didn't see the major dislocation that I think some feared at the outset of the pandemic. And against this backdrop, look, we've seen remarkable progress in um, in science that allows us to understand the fundamental biological basis of more disease. It's very rare these days that a drug is put into development where you don't understand a very clear rationale for why it would work at a molecular level in the intervention of a disease. You know, years ago, we used to screen uh, targets against large compound libraries, and we would get a find a compound in a big library that hit a target and would put it understanding how it um, was working to intervene in a particular disease mechanism. Now, those kinds of uh, development programs are rare. Uh, not, not Putting a drug into development where you don't really have a clear understanding of its mechanistic basis is rare. And in fact, uh, I wouldn't say it's a requirement for the regulatory process, but it's certainly preferred when you're coming through drug development inside the agency, if you have a very clear rationale on why a drug would work. And so just, you know, the, the greater insight into biology of disease has opened up vast new opportunities. 
uh, the last organ really to be drugged where we're still making some fundamental biological insights, but you're seeing very rapid, um, you know, rapid evolution is the brain. I think we're going to see a lot of opportunities to treat intractable brain diseases, both mental health as well as neurodegenerative diseases that so far have eluded us or not been amenable to really effective therapies. And so there's a lot of opportunities there. And then the final point I'll make, and I know we're going to touch on this probably, um, is just the opportunities in cell and gene therapy. I think continued product innovation, coming up with better platforms for developing cells and gene therapies is opening up a whole new opportunity set with respect to those, those modalities as well. Couldn't agree with you more. Very excited about the prospects there in cell and gene therapy. Tell me a little bit about how you see mRNA evolving as a modality. I mean, it was the modality of the moment during the pandemic, no question about it. How do you see us leveraging that as an industry as we go forward? Well, look, clearly um, it looks very effective as a platform for vaccines. I'm on the board of Pfizer, as you mentioned, which has made um, the COVID vaccines, developing other vaccines off that mRNA platform. So is Moderna. Um, and so are other companies for that matter. So I think mRNA has um, demonstrated to be a very effective platform for vaccines. And, you know, there's some qualities about it that make it uh, uniquely attractive. One is that the mRNA itself, the mRNA component seems to be immunogenic. So it actually, you know, upregulates or stimulates the immune system. So an mRNA vaccine in some ways is autoadjuvanted. If you look at the other, the protein-based vaccines that have been put into development, for example, for COVID, they all contain novel ad adjuvants. People sort of talk about the protein-based vaccines as if they're, you know, sort of old technology. They have very novel technology in them um, in terms of the, the adjuvants that they used. With the mRNA vaccines, you don't have an, an adjuvant included because uh, in many respects, the mRNA itself is creating some upregulation, some stimulation in the immune system at the same time that you're delivering the antigen in the form of mRNA that gets converted into protein. So I think that these, these are going to be um, attractive for other uh, vaccine settings, first and foremost. And in particular, one of the things that was striking about the data around the mRNA vaccine, I remember the first time I was shown the data uh, you know, the data from the Pfizer vaccine was shown to the board. The thing that was most striking was the consistency of the efficacy result in that initial data set. You know, you saw you saw old, literally as you went down sort of segments of ages by by 10 years, you had a very consistent result. And typically, as you know, with vaccines, you don't see that. And typically you see a fall off in efficacy, um, especially among an older population. And you didn't see that here. And so it does raise the, the possibility. And I think it's becoming more than a possibility that this this platform may be, you know, uniquely suited to try and provide immunogenicity to an older individual, uh, whereas traditional platforms you, you don't see as good of a response. We usually have to use larger doses in older individuals. This platform seems to be um, particularly well suited to those settings. And the other thing, the other obvious advantage is just the ability to go from, um, you know, so an antigen to a, to a vaccine very quickly by using the mRNA sequence and the ability to put in the syringe things that might not be stable. So for example, with the flu vaccine, one of, one of the reasons why this platform is attractive for the um, potential creation of an influenza vaccine, and in fact, Pfizer had a flu program with their mRNA platform before they pivoted into developing COVID, is that our flu, our flu vaccine each year is made uh, based on one antigen. So there's two immunodominant epitopes in, on the influenza virus, um, HA and NA. And the, the it, so they're both proteins on the surface of the virus. The vaccine that we get every year only has one of those proteins in it. And the reason why both proteins aren't included is because one's unstable. It's hard to get it in the syringe and keep it stable. So you're only getting immunized against one of the immunodominant epitopes with influenza every year when you use sort of a protein-based recombinant vaccine. With mRNA, you're not, you don't have to put the protein in the syringe. So if the protein's unstable, that's not a problem. What you're putting in the syringe is the mRNA sequence that codes for the protein. So with the mRNA platform, you can actually get both of those immunodominant epitopes into the, into the syringe, and you can potentially vaccinate against both, both proteins on the surface of the influenza, which might provide better efficacy, might provide better durability for the flu vaccine. So there's things you can do with mRNA that you can't do with traditional vaccines. And then the final point I would just make is that the other advantage is you can go from, you know, sort of identification of the, you know, the, the, the virus to production of a vaccine very quickly because you don't have to figure out how to um, scale the grow the virus itself in a cell culture. Um, and that's been a rate limiting step in the past, particularly with novel viruses. And that's why this vaccine platform, I think, is uniquely attractive for um, 
pandemic strains, novel viruses, where the first step would be to try to grow it in a cell culture. Here you could you could potentially sidestep that uh, complexity. And then the final the final final point. I'm sorry, <laughs> is you know this is a platform that was being used to try to develop therapeutics, and I think those opportunities are still going to be very accessible. Moderna was pursuing uh, oncology. Um, targets with this platform. Pfizer was looking at therapeutic applications. So it's not just going to be used, in my view, in the future for uh, developing vaccines. I think you're going to see the ability to deliver mRNA that then codes for the production of proteins being used as a way to deliver therapy, either on a sort of, you know, episodic basis or, or for, you know, routine administration. I think this platform is going to open up a lot of possibilities. It's exciting. And how do you see and witness the balance right now between focus on the next pandemic and pandemic preparedness and then other therapeutic areas of interest? Uh, as you talked about earlier, you know, the brain being another area of focus for the future. How do you see the balance between between the pandemic and, and just future therapeutics and the prospect of those in general? Yeah, look, I, I don't see an ordinate focus on, um, you know, pandemic preparedness and, and um you know, developing COVID therapeutics, certainly not in a way that it's uh, preoccupied the activities of a large swath of the industry and, and even the companies that are engaged in it. I mean, Pfizer, you know, is obviously broadly involved in a lot of other activities through the pandemic. This has been a tremendous focus, but it hasn't stopped work on other therapeutic priorities. I, I, you know, I, I say that with a little bit of chagrin sort of broadly, that there hasn't been this focus on pandemic preparedness more broadly. I, I don't think you've seen... Um, Congress sort of contemplate what what is the future preparedness posture that we need? What kinds of investments should we be making and keeping a hot base of preparedness for future contingencies? Um, you know, what kind of preparedness should we have if COVID takes some unexpected twists and turns? Are we going to be able to scale up the manufacturing of novel monoclonal antibodies and get them approved through a very expedited regulatory process? Have we really created a framework for the rapid adaptation of the vaccine if this should undergo? Um, some unexpected changes very quickly. I don't think a lot of that's been done, quite frankly. We're sort of three years into this. Uh, and all those kind of points that I just raised about do we have this in place, do we have that in place, we don't. Um, and it's more, of a, it's more of a policy issue. I think the industry is in a good posture to be able to respond quickly. I think we haven't really firmed up some of the policy considerations that we need to to have good uh, good preparedness. But with respect to the, you know, the other aspects of the industry's portfolio, the non-COVID aspects of the industry's portfolio, as I said at the outset, I think that there has been, you know, certainly there's been tremendous capital that's flowed into biotech and life sciences over the last couple of years. I think there's been significant progress. You haven't seen um, a real drop off in drug approvals. You haven't seen a drop off, a substantial drop off in drug development. A lot of clinical trials, as I said, were, you know, continued. A lot of site-based clinical trials continue, particularly in oncology and areas like that. And so you didn't see the major disruptions. You continue to see capital flows. You continue to see a lot of scientific innovation that's going to lead to, I think, future drug development in areas that we haven't been able to drug in the past. That's great. Uh, I want to come back to your comments later on, on some of the infrastructure uh, that you, you made earlier. But coming back to the biotech investment area, actually, uh, great segue to another question. What are you most excited about there in terms of the investments that are coming in the space and what you're seeing? What are you witnessing? What, what excites you most about the uh, biotech industry and the investment areas there? Hey, look, I think that there are some fundamental insights into um, immuno-oncology that's going to allow the therapeutics in that space to to hopefully be far more effective. I think we've kind of um, hit a point where we recognize that there are some missing aspects to our understanding of the biology of intervening um, in the immune system to try as a tool for combating cancer. We've had we had sort of tremendous breakthroughs with the PDL one and PD one inhibitors, and then we've had some challenges trying to um, attack solid tumors with those approaches, and um, you know, improve the efficacy of the existing drugs. And I think that there, there, if you look at the literature, there are been some recent insights into the, those mechanisms that things like the PD-1 inhibitors target, where there may be opportunities to create therapeutics that could be a substantial improvement over the existing therapy. I think we've kind of reached a point where we're starting to make some fundamental insights. And there was a sense that we're missing something. We're not, we're not recognizing something. And I think that something is starting to get recognized. The other big area that I would just point to is just cell and gene therapy, which I touched on. Um, 
you know, there, I think that the, the significant opportunities are going to come from product innovations, the ability to develop better platforms for manufacturing cells, for getting um, gene cassettes into cells to, to manipulate uh, the, the genetic instruction set in cells, things like the, improving upon things like the AAV vector, finding better platforms for delivering larger gene cassettes. Um, you know, if you think about it, I, the, the, the analogy I give is to monoclonal antibodies. If you think back to like the early 2000s or late 1990s, I was at FDA in the early 2000s working as a senior advisor to the commissioner. And what I often say is that if someone would have said to me back then that uh, one day we'll be using monoclonal antibodies to treat high cholesterol and asthma, I would have thought that that was in completely insane because back then, you know, monoclonal antibodies were therapeutic antibodies were a relatively uncertain modality. We couldn't characterize them well. As you change the manufacturing process, things would happen to the um, to the um, antibodies that would produce that would change their clinical profile. And FDA didn't know didn't know how to discern that. We didn't have the tools for looking at antibodies and looking at their structural features and saying that two things were were similar. And so the and they were also murian. You know, they, the, the original antibodies, you remember, were partly based on on mouse um, grafts. So, so they, they had a lot of side effects associated with them. And they weren't some of them weren't that effective, the early ones. So they were reserved for third line therapy. They were reserved for, you know, sort of third line cancer and, and, and um, more devastating conditions. But then you saw a lot of product innovation. You saw the advent of the fully humanized antibody, the Abgenix and Metarex mouse, the ability to really characterize them very well. And now antibodies are a routine part of clinical care. They're used for primary care conditions. I think that the same thing's going to happen with cell and gene therapy. Right now, we think of gene therapy as something that's reserved for, you know, pediatric, devastating pediatric inherited disorders and rare diseases. Um, and the same thing to some degree with cell therapies where they're, where they're being um, developed. I think as you get more product innovation, more innovation in how those products are manufactured, how they're delivered, you're going to see greater certainty about their clinical profile, greater certainty about the durability of the treatment, greater certainty about the ability to prevent off-target effects, to get the right insertions. Um, yield's going to go up, you know, when you transfect cells and put in a new, new, new gene instruction set, you're going to get better processes if you're doing that and yields are going to go up, costs are going to go down. And as all those things happen, as you get that product innovation, I think that the, um, the range of therapeutic applications is going to expand dramatically as you get sort of greater certainty around the safety profile and the costs come down. That's going to happen. Uh, you know, we, we look at people sort of look at the market today, the gene therapy market, and look at how expensive these therapies are. The reality is the cost of goods are exorbitant uh, in these therapies. And so I'm not, well, I'm not arguing that there's not a, a significant margin on these therapies and companies that are manufacturing them in most cases. I mean, some cases they're not, but in most cases they're able to do it profitably. Um, it's only been able to be done profitably because the prices are so high and that's creating a lot of complexities in, in terms of how they're paid for. Those prices are going to come down. And so I think people who sort of in a policy realm who kind of bemoan the cost of these drugs and, and, and you hear a lot of in Washington, and I'm in Washington today, people talking about you know, Capitol Hill tomorrow, people talk about, you know, how is the system going to afford this? This is going to bankrupt the system. I think it um, takes for granted how much product innovation is going to happen very rapidly. That's going to change the economics. Um, I remember hearing the story about the first, the predecessor to Rituxin by IDEC, um, the first anti-CD20 drug that they had made. It was basically a bespoke drug. The CEO described it to me. I, I can't fully relate the story. I've forgotten a lot of it, but it was basically like a bespoke drug that was manufactured for each individual patient. And if I remember correctly, it cost like forty dollars or $50,000 a dose. And this was back in you know the mid-90s. Um, so it was just, it wasn't a viable commercial product, even though it looked very effective and it wasn't a, until they had some product innovations that they were able to manufacture this at scale and not do it on a, an individualized pa uh, patient basis that they were able to actually develop a commercial product. Same thing's going to happen in cell and gene therapy. You know, right now, many of these products are very bespoke, very patient specific, but I think you're going to have opportunities to have off the shelf products. That's really going to change the game. What a great prospect for patients and patient care worldwide to have that opportunity. Let's switch gears for a minute. We were talking about costs and costs of therapy. Let's talk a little bit about inflation and the impact that plays in this segment of market. How do you think inflation is going to play out in the biopharma industry? And when you think about it, do you think it's going to change the context of how we think about biosimilars in, in that regard? 
Yeah, look, this has been a segment that's been plagued by um, high inflation for a long time. Um, you know, regulatory costs have gone up far faster than the cost of uh, than, than the ability to reprice products in this market. Um, I think the challenge is you're seeing costs continue to go up, and a lot of the costs in drug development are being driven by the um, regulatory costs, increasing regulatory costs, and the ability to take price increases is being uh, eroded. So, you know, whereas you looked historically, companies would take increases year over year, and it was sort of a stepwise fashion in terms of how price increases would be taken under in the injectable space and especially space to sort of correlate with ASP plus 6%. Every company took their 5% price increase each year. It's becoming much harder to do that, to, to raise the, um, the, the real price. And in fact, uh, real prices have come down. List prices, you know, have gone up not nearly as dramatically as they have in past years, but the actual real price on average paid for drugs has gone down because you're seeing compression of the rebating and you're seeing more discipline around list price increases by companies because it's hard to take a list price increase on drugs. There's a, it's not just hard to push it through the, the commercial segment, but um, there's a lot of political scrutiny paid to companies. And so they're very, I think they're very aware of making sure they're not taking price increases that are going to, uh, going to capture a lot of attention. So you know, that's going to be pressure. I don't know that the, the environment um, that we're in right now where you're seeing inflation across the economy really changes the equation for companies. I mean, it's going to obviously have an impact um, and add more pressure on top of pressures that already existed. But uh, I'm not sure that it's going to really change the equation of, of the dynamic of the company that the industry has been under for some time. I mean, biggest price increase, biggest price inflation, I think that's going to impact the industry is uh, is around personnel. You're seeing the industry do things, in my view, to change the um, model in ways that could be more cost effective. I think you're seeing companies particularly large companies, but across the board, companies change how they sell products, um, how they how they detail physicians, how they interact with physicians using more virtual interactions. That's going to cut down on costs. You're seeing companies bring more of the development work in-house, I think, with the hope of getting better control over it and execution and maybe bringing down costs. So, you know, whereas in the past, a lot of the um, a lot of the development work was outsourced to CROs and a lot of the commercial aspects of the enterprise were were done in-house, I think you're seeing a little bit of a switch where a lot of the commercial work is being um, externalized using virtual platforms and other kinds of selling models. And a lot of the development work is being brought in-house. And I think that that's driven to some degree by um, by the cost pressures. And probably, you know, the biggest place you're going to see the, the cost pressures potentially play out is on the R&D budgets. I think that, you know, companies are going to scrutinize very carefully the P&L hit of their continued investments in R&D. And that's not to say that investments in R&D are going to go down, but I think you're going to have to see company, you're going to see companies probably take costs out of other aspects of the business to be able to maintain the very large R&D budgets that, um, that most companies maintain. Thanks for that. And sort of on a related note, um, one of the other burning platforms last year we talked about was supply chain. And in fact, I'd say, you know, as much as many of us hoped that would actually improve in the last year, I think it's it's just intensified some of our challenges there. What are you seeing now as you think about the supply chain and the, the pharma industry? What are you hearing? What are you seeing and observing there as we think about getting back to a, a more steady state? Yeah, look, I, I, I'm seeing, and it's anecdotal improvements in the ability to source materials. I, I think that um, we're getting back to, you know, a little bit more of a safe state in supply chain and away from some of the shocks that we saw as a result of the pandemic. Um, China's still a big uncertainty. Uh, I think that I don't see what the end game is for the Chinese government in terms of controlling COVID. I don't think in the age of Omicron, you can adopt a zero COVID policy anymore. It's going to be impossible to keep Omicron out. Um, unless they adopt very dr drastic measures, which is what they did in Shanghai. But I don't, my view is that the kinds of lockdowns that they impose in Shanghai aren't sustainable uh, and you can't just implement them on a rolling basis when you have outbreaks. The end game to me would be to uh, make more widespread use of effective vaccines. The Chinese government has access to vaccine platforms that could be and probably would be more effective against Omicron. They made a decision so far not to deploy them. They also uh, have a population that while the overall vaccination statistics look reasonably good 
relative to other countries, um, it's skewed very young. And so the older population tries the exact opposite of what you'd want. The older population is largely unvaccinated or under vaccinated, not boosted, not vaccinated. I think there's 52 million people over the age of 80 who haven't been vaccinated at all. Um, the booster rate is only around 50 percent for those over the age of 65. So they have a under vaccinated older population. Um, I don't know why I've, I've asked people why that is. Uh, some have speculated there's more mistrust among the older population uh, of the government, more cultural mistrust. And so you've seen more of a reluctance to use the vaccine among an older versus a younger population. But that creates a lot of vulnerability. And I think that, you know, future supply disruptions probably are, you know, in the cards because of future disruptions inside China and, and, and a maintenance of a, a zero COVID policy in an age when I think it's going to be impossible to do that. And the other piece of this, uh, just the broader supply chain question is I think that the pandemic has created an awareness of the vulnerability of having um, a supply chain that's very far flung, um, that relies on materials from lots of other different countries, some in parts of the world that there may be more political uncertainty. Uh, so I think that you're seeing a movement generally towards trying to bring more of the supply chain uh, to domestic production, uh, to domestic facilities. and. Um, get better control over very long lines of supply, you know, whereas starting materials come from sources in one country and then intermediates are made in another country and then fill finishing is done in another country, trying to get more control over that and trying to make sure less of it is dependent upon parts of the world that uh, are a little uncertain. I think to some degree um, that means a lot of companies are looking at their supply chain going through China and, th and there's going to be, I think, a rethinking of that and an effort to try to bring more of the production um, to domestic uh, you know, sources. And you saw in the in the PDUFA package that was proposed in the House last week, um, the creation of a category of advanced manufacturing technology and the creation of a policy mechanism that gives preferential treatment to products that are developed on what, what's considered adva advanced manufacturing platforms. And so that is basically a nod to things like continuous manufacturing um, and having sophisticated um, biologics manufacturing located using high, developed using high technology platforms that could be um, high tech, low, low footprint. And so low labor where those, the, there'd be sort of, um, there'd be an advantage to locate them domestically. So if you think of a continuous manufacturing platform for small molecule pharmaceuticals, that's a, um, a small footprint, high tech platform. I mean, I, I saw those, I toured them and a lot of the uh, language in the house bill was geared towards this kind of uh, innovation. That's something that you would, you might want to locate in downtown Boston, not, not necessarily um, overseas because before you might've located your manufacturing overseas because you were trying to capture lower labor costs and in some cases, lower energy costs. But if you're dealing with a platform that doesn't require a lot of labor, but is very sophisticated and high tech requires a lot of skilled personnel to operate. That's something that you'd probably want to locate, uh, you know, domestically or, you know, maybe in the UK, someplace like that. So I think that this is going to drive a lot of or create opportunities to bring a lot of manufacturing back to domestic um, sources. The other big input, obviously, for manufacturing is energy. And, it, you know, we we in many respects have lower energy costs in other parts of the world right now where um, products were manufactured. So I think some of the advantage of manufacturing overseas are gonna be eroded by advances in technology. And the house bill was clearly an effort to try to accelerate that. I mean, I was there when we made the initial proposals to get money in FDA's budget for those, for trying to develop regulatory processes to promote the, um, the migration onto these advanced manufacturing platforms in both the cell and gene therapy space, as well as the small molecule space. And the language in the house bill basically adopts that. So it's very clear that that's part, it's a continuation of the same process, at least in my view. Excellent. And switching gears for a minute from resource constraints and, and costs to now resource preservation. Let me ask you, you, you talked about energy a minute ago. How are you viewing sustainability as, as a priority relative to all the other dynamics in the industry at this point? What are you seeing and how do you think it's going to evolve? Yeah, look, it's it's clearly a priority um, of the companies that I'm familiar with that I in, interact with. I think, you know, one place where you see uh, 
uh, a lot of effort being made is on the um, the environmental footprint of the of the of the industry. A lot of the biggest environmental impact from the industry is through the manufacturing process, and and I think you're seeing an effort to try to uh, make those processes more green, lower the carbon output from traditional manufacturing, and that's another reason why I think more of this could potentially move um, out of the places where manufacturing has traditionally been done. I think there's going to be an effort to get more control of the supply chain. There's going to be an effort. There's going to be some national security considerations around where products are manufactured and making sure they have, they're done in, in parts of the world where you can have a reliable source. But there's also going to be an effort to adopt technologies um, that make them less impact, make those processes less impactful to the environment. And I think that's going to be better done uh, in places like the United States than places where some ma- some of the manufacturing has traditionally been done like China and India. So I think that that's going to be another factor weighing on decisions to uh, change where manufacturing is done. Now, obviously, a lot of this is also you know, a lot of the fill finishing and a lot of the work is also done based on where, um, you know, what, what the, based on what the tax treatment is in different uh, jurisdictions. But you're seeing international laws change around that, too, where I think that there is less advantage to manufacturing in one jurisdiction over another, especially given some of these offsetting considerations. Great. Thank you for that. One of the other areas that was really exciting during the pandemic is the just incredible intense speed of regulatory approval and the regulatory response during the pandemic. Do you think regulatory entities are going to now recalibrate to ensure you know, more rigor in the process for biomanufacturers? How, how do you think about that? Yeah, I, you know, I, I don't have a view that they ever um, you know, became lax in terms of the rigor of the regulatory process. I think that there were definitely accommodations made um, for some of the things that you weren't able to do during uh, during a pandemic. So you couldn't do on-site infe- inspections of manufacturing facilities. You had missing data in clinical trials that you needed to find constructs using real-world evidence to try to uh, compensate for missing data in clinical trials. You needed to decentralize clinical trials because you couldn't bring patients into site-based, um, you know, site-based raters and, and, and into hospitals and, and physician offices for purposes of monitoring them. So you had to move some of the monitoring to the home, do data collection directly from the patient. So I think that you're going to see a continuation of um, those kinds of innovations. Um, but that, to me, that wasn't really um, making the regulatory process more lax uh, or more permissive. I think it was just uh, accommodations for what you couldn't do in a setting of a pandemic. And I think what the agency's been able to demonstrate and what it's learned is some of, this, some of these work quite well. And what the industry's learned is some of these work quite well. You can lower costs. You can expand enrollment. You can move clinical trials to non-traditional venues. You can get more diversity into clinical trials when you're not um, held to only enrolling in brick and mortar physical sites when you can enroll people virtually. So I think people have found a lot of these work quite well and you're going to see a continuation of them. Um, So I never really saw anything that I would say was, um, you know, FDA becoming much more permissive in terms of what what it would allow or level of uncertainty would embrace clearly the, the setting where that um you know where there was some truth to that was in the setting of the uh, the emergency use authorizations and, and trying to get products to the market rapidly on um small complements of data but you know even there i think that they they held those products to a pretty high standard especially in the setting of an emergency and and where the accommodations were made under the eoa process wasn't um, necessarily on the requirements around clinical data. I mean, look how long it took FDA to approve remdesivir. They waited for the readout of the randomized trial, the NIH trial and, and the British trial um, before they made a, an approval of that. Uh, and for the vaccines, they didn't appro- authorize the vaccines initially on an interim analysis. And all the subsequent authorizations were made on readouts of pretty robust clinical trials. I mean, the, the initial clinical trials for these vaccines, remember, were 40,000 patient trials. Collectively, probably over 100,000 patients were enrolled in, in the initial vaccine trials, largest clinical trials ever undertaken for any medical product, where the accommodation was made was more on the CMC side. Um, and that's what the EUA process allowed, because, you know, instead of doing the complicated CMC package and doing all the stability testing to demonstrate that, you know, the vaccines, for example, I'll take them as an example, can, you know, have a shelf life of, you know, 
16 months and be stored in X temperature for X amount of time and in, in you know, in a refrigerator and a freezer and that if they went outside those those temperature constraints, they would still be stable. All the things that you would do when you're putting something into the normal supply chain, because, you know, once you put something into the normal supply chain, you know, it's going to sit on a shelf for too long. It's going to be on a truck that, you know, breaks down and gets warm and, and things are going to happen. So you want to do a range of uh, testing, um, stability testing to make sure that products are durable and they can live outside very narrow ranges that testing when these products first came to the market wasn't done and the reason it wasn't done was because um, that's what the EOA allowed you didn't need the full CMC section to be completed at the time of the authorization and you didn't need to necessarily be as concerned about those those issues because you knew you were putting products into the market that were going to be tightly distributed they were going to they're basically being bought by the government they were going to be distributed by the government and they were going to be distributed right away um you know the initial for a long time we didn't have enough vaccines everything that we were producing was getting used and so you didn't you didn't have to worry about something going into normal distribution where you had a myriad of you know uh, pharmacies and wholesalers and other intermediaries distributing something yet it was very tightly controlled so the eua process allowed the fda not to do all the cmc work and a lot of what what's happening now is it going back and doing these full approvals is they're doing the long-term stability test and that's why you're seeing the companies come out with announcements that you know we now have data showing that this can be held in normal refrigeration for two months and then in a normal fr freezer for x months because those studies have been done um if you would have done those studies up front, we wouldn't have had the vaccines for another six or eight months. And so the EOA process allowed that portion of the application not to be fully complete at the time of the initial authorization, whereas it would for, half, for full approval for BLA. Um, but I don't see that as a, a, an accommodation on the, um, the level of you know, safety and efficacy information that FDA required. And I think that this is not not in this context and not anyone on this call, because we're all familiar with this, but outside this context, when you're like, on Twitter, when I'm on Twitter debating people and they say FDA cut a lot of corners for the authorization of these vaccines, you know, my response is no, they didn't. They actually required enormous outcome studies um, where they made some accommodation with the initial authorizations was on the stability testing because they knew these were going to be, you know, put into a tightly controlled supply chain and distributed right away. So that that that's very different um, than, you know, the FDA creating a whole lot of uh, regulatory accommodation. I, I, I think they actually, um, you know, they, they did on, in some respects, but in other respects, they really didn't. How do you think about, let me ask about a specific example. And uh, you earlier commented on, on how exciting the technology may be as we think about the brain and development there. I wonder if you can comment on the developments in the AAV, specifically Alzheimer's drug sector. Um, I think about Lilly's uh, clinical trials in China and those getting slowed recently. How do you think about that as it plays into the regulatory landscape here? Well, look, I, it's hard for me to know exactly what's going on with the clinical trials in China. It's not just Lilly. We saw some other um, programs that had to get modified because they relied um, primarily or exclusively on data derived from, clinic, from China. You know, when I was at FDA, there was, um, and this is all public, uh, there was a um, an amnesty announced inside China that that anyone who had falsified data, they would they would provide amnesty if you withdrew it. And I remember the statistic at the time was startling in terms of the percentage of applications that were withdrawn from the Chinese FDA, um, but it was it was a very high percentage. Um, there was a perception, and I think rightfully so, that the uh, there was um, you know a lot of uh, behaviors over there that wouldn't meet Western regulatory standards. I'm trying to be uh, polite, <laughs> and um, but there was also a perception. I had met with the Chinese, the head of the Chinese C FDA at the time, and you know they were making a lot of commitments to really clean up. They they recognized that. Um, they had a lot of lax activities and they were making significant commitments to really tighten their own um, regulatory oversight uh, and clean up a lot of the practices that had been going on that, that we thought had been going on. Um, and, uh, you know, Rick Pazder, the head of the oncology division, did a probably two week trip to China, toured a lot of clinical trial sites and facilities, met with a lot of officials, came back. Um, I remember talking to him when he came back, felt um you know, fairly confident that there was a level of earnestness about 
um, improving the approaches there and trying to put China on par with uh, with Western regulatory agencies and, and, and put the systems there on par with our our practices. Um, and the only thing I can conclude from the announcements I've seen uh, is that that has fallen short. You know, that 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 and if you listen to some of the comments that Rick's made, um, you know, that that's what I gleaned from listening to him, knowing where he was back in 2019, 2017, when, when we were sort of struggling with this. And and there was a change in the view of FDA about data coming out of China and, and the conduct of clinical trials in China and the regulatory oversight in that country. And hearing um, a little bit of you know what I can sort of characterize as buyer's remorse uh, on the part of some of the FDA officials, uh, it sounds to me like that's what's happened. Like they, they've had a realization that in fact um, you know the approaches in China didn't didn't live up to what was promised. So that's what I surmise based on not knowing specifically what's going on, not having talked to Rick about it, not being inside the FDA anymore. Um, but just knowing what I, knowing, you know, what was said publicly back in 2017, 2019, the sentiment and then seeing the announcements now and, and trying to glean the sentiment off of people's statements. That's what I would, um, that's what I would summarize about that, about the conduct of trials. And I think you asked me about the Alzheimer's drug. I, I, you probably were referring to the reimbursement issue with CMS, um, which is, you know, a whole nother matter, but I think that the, um, you know, CMS, the decision that CMS made around um, around the Biogen product in, in particular, um, where they they non-covered it effectively. I mean, they were only covering in clinical trial, which is non-coverage, but they went a step further and basically said part of the basis for their non-coverage is the fact that that drug was approved through accelerated approval. So so they basically um, they, they took they, they did did things that were gratuitous in the context of that coverage decision that went well beyond just a coverage decision around their discrete analysis of the efficacy and safety data for that particular product, but carved out a whole nother, um, uh, whole nother paradigm for themselves of authority to be able to non cover things just by virtue of the uh, regulatory process that they've come through. And that's been something CMS has long wanted to do, but there's been discipline to prevent the agency from doing that. And I think that this process lacked discipline and C CMS really crossed a significant line in the context of this coverage decision. And, and what it means is that any company coming through um, accelerated approval on the Part B side, that's probably a non-oncolytic because I think CMS is gonna be reluctant to change its coverage criteria, at least in the near term for oncology products. And it's gonna be reluctant to do anything that would deviate from the NCCN compendia around oncology products, at least for the time being. But I think if you're outside oncology with a Part B drug, particularly a drug that's come through accelerated approval, um, I think you're facing a much different CMS. And I think CMS has basically adopted the kind of approach that they took to a lot of medical devices to to the Part B drugs now. And at least that's what they did with Adjahelm. And the Adjahelm decision to me looked, and the, the decision around Alzheimer's products more generally that target amyloid um, um, plaque removal, um, looks a lot like the Taver decision. If you want sort of a proxy um, for, for what CMS did here, look at what they did to the minimally invasive aortic valve, where they basically only covered that in certain circumstances where data was being collected prospectively, and then they put a lot of requirements on how that product would be delivered, requirements that really weren't, um, in my view, fully based on um, sound clinical judgment, but were based on a desire to try to control utilization of that product. They, they only allowed certain centers to deliver the product and they based that on, on an, um, a view that only high volume centers should be doing it. They required cardiac surgeons and cardiologists to be in a room at the same time. They based that on a view that if something went wrong, you want the cardiac surgeon on site. I viewed that as a, an attempt to try to make sure that you didn't have a turf war and competition between interventional cardiologists and cardiac surgeons to implant the procedure, which would have driven up volumes. So they wanted to prevent that. So they made sure both providers had to be in the room at the same time when the procedures were done. Um, you know, very clever, but those were, I think those were attempts to try to control the, the commercial use of the product and not necessarily just born of, um, clinical judgment. I think the clinical judgment was sort of backed into them after the fact. Um, but the, the primary purpose was, was a commercial prerogative. And I think the same thing, we saw the same thing with, with Adjahelm and with the decision broadly around the Alzheimer's products. And it's going to have a chilling effect. I think it's, it's, it was a profound decision. Um, the most profound aspects of it, I think were, parts of it that weren't really widely recognized. And it's often the case that agencies will make um, profound policy uh, 
in the context of decisions that are otherwise politically attractive. You know, this was a this was a decision that was applauded in the media because there was a sort of um, it, it got caught up, I think, in a lot of political views around accelerated approval and um, what criteria companies should be held to, the, what standard they should be held to if they're going to market products that are going to ultimately end up costing a lot of money. Um, and so there were a lot of people who were um, had a negative view uh, of, of this product and didn't want to see CMS cover it broadly. And I think what you saw with, with the coverage decision is they did that, but they also embedded it in a lot of other policy um, and they were able to get away with it because people were sort of focused on the top line and weren't focused on the, the policy rationale of driving that decision, which I think is very corrosive. Okay, I have two more questions for you, and then we're going to open it up to uh, to the broader audience. But this is probably a question you get asked, I would suspect, quite often. Um, what do you think the future is for COVID-19? How are we going to live with this in the endemic phase? And do you think we're going to see a fifth booster? What's what's your prediction, Scott? Yeah, look, I think this is a transition year where we're going from sort of a pandemic phase to an endemic phase. And um, I would define an endemic phase as when this is no longer continuous waves of infection, but it settles into a more seasonal pattern. That doesn't endemic phase doesn't mean that we're not going to have a lot of infection and it doesn't mean that we're ne not necessarily going to have a lot of death and disease from this infection, but it's going to be uh, more predictable waves of infection. This will become more of a winter pathogen, which is what a, a coronavirus should be. I think we're in that transition year right now. I think the summer is going to have low prevalence levels. And as we come back in the fall, we're probably going to be grappling with one of these new variants. It's most likely going to be a variant within the Omicron lineage, barring something unexpected happening, which is, of course, possible because unexpected things have happened for the last three years. But, you know, right now, the assumption would be it's either going to be B, B2.121, which is the strain that's now um, spreading in New York, although it looks like it's peaked and looks like it's slowing down in its rate of spread, or B4, B5, which is an Omicron lineage that's now spreading in South Africa and seems to pierce the immunity from prior infection with B1, with Omicron, people who are unvaccinated. So it looks like it's going to be one of these variants or maybe something similar to them. Uh, and I do think that we're probably going to be switching over the vaccine. I mean, we need to see the data. Um, we haven't yet. Um, both Moderna and Pfizer are working on new new vaccines based on the Omicron lineage. Um, it's based on a, B, a B1 strain of the virus. But I think that there is a, a good reason to believe based on other experimental data that being boosted with uh, um, an Omicron variant is probably going to provide better protection against these new Omicron variants that we're seeing. You certainly saw data out of South Africa that would suggest that out of the Siegel's lab, uh, who's a very good researcher, um, looked at reinfections with people with B4B5. And what they found was that people who had an Omicron, a previous Omicron infection with B1, didn't have good protection against B4B B and B5. And in fact, there are reinfections happening in South Africa. There was an eightfold drop in the um, titers, the neutralizing antibody titers between people who had B1 and now were confronting B4B5. So their, their antibody titers that they had from their B1 infection didn't neutralize B4B5 B4 well at all. But people who had been vaccinated and then had a breakthrough infection with Omicron had pretty robust protection against B4B5. B5. And I don't think it's a huge leap, although it's a leap, I will admit it, to postulate or to, to sort of speculate that um, that a bivalent vaccine or delivering, you know, either 50% Omicron, 50% of the ancestral lineage, which is one possibility for the fall, or an Omicron only vaccine delivered as a booster to the existing vaccine could simulate that effect. It could simulate the effect of a breakthrough infection where you're providing targeted, um, you know, protection against Omicron on the backbone, on the backdrop of someone who already has baseline immunity that's derived from from the vaccine with the ancestral strain. So I think that there was reason to believe that that um, an Omicron-based vaccine and maybe a bivalent vaccine, there seems to be some um, view in the policy world that maybe a bivalent vaccine is a, is a way to hedge, hedge your bets because you're getting you know, sort of the best of both worlds. You're getting the targeted protection against the Omicron lineage, but you're also um, providing a booster against the ancestral strain, which provides the broadest possible immunity from what we've seen. That, um, that that's also going to provide better protection in the existing vaccine against these new Omicron sublineages that we're seeing. So I, so short answer to your question is I, I think COVID is going to be back in the fall. It's not, I don't think the, the White House estimate that they put out in recent days of, of 
you know, speculating that could be upwards of 100 million infections. It's not crazy if you think about how many infections you could have over the course of the whole season. You know, we have 30, 40 million flu infections over the course of a whole season. Um, a lot of those infections are going to be very mild and not get reported. They're the modeling that the White House is using is based on an assumption that there's not going to be any mitigation, that we're basically back to normal life, which we kind of are right now. I mean, um, I think people have gotten back to normal routines, in-person meetings, in-person events. So, um, you know, you, you're going to be dependent upon vaccination and previously acquired immunity. And people who were previously infected with B1, um, unless they're vaccinated, will that immunity will have waned. That immunity is not going to be that durable. Uh, we've now seen a lot of evidence that the immunity conferred by Omicron isn't as durable as the immunity conferred by prior strains. So you'll have a whole bunch of people who you know, we're never vaccinated, but right now have pretty good durable immunity, they're going to be susceptible again to fall. So they're going to get reinfected, you know, and they'll probably be people who are a little bit more, um, maybe a little bit more confident, overconfident, because they were previously infected, and they don't think they're going to get it again. And then you're going to have to um, mount another booster campaign um, to deliver vaccines. And you're probably not going to get the same uptake this time around that you've gotten in, in last rounds. I think you're going to do better than what we've historically done with flu vaccine. But remember, in a sort of in, in our best years for flu vaccine before COVID, we would vaccinate 120 million people. Uh, that was considered a really good year. I think the, the, the record was like 130 million people in one season. And that's with um, mandated vaccines for children for, for influenza. Um, so, you know, are you going to do better with COVID? I think you certainly will. But are you going to be able to revaccinate two thirds of the population in the fall? You might not be able to. And so that's why, you know, you're going to see continued spread. Very helpful. So one final question from me, and then we'll turn it over to the audience. So in your book, you highlighted some of the challenges with the pandemic response. And I'm curious if you could real quick, tell us a little bit about what you think the two or three learnings are that we should be heeding as we go forward uh, in preparedness for the next pandemic. Yeah, look, I think the, the two biggest learnings were one, we don't, we, we thought we had sort of an agency equipped to respond to a pandemic. And we thought that agency was the CDC and it wasn't, you know, CDC is sort of a deeply retrospective, very academic organization. Um, they're not a real time analysis organization. They're not an organization that can collect data from uh, routine clinical practice and put out a uh, very rapid analysis to inform current decision making. They'd rather take six months and do a morbidity and mortality weekly report and be sort of the final word on a question rather than the first word. And what you needed was an agency that was able to respond to a crisis in a real time fashion. You needed the Joint Special Operations Command for Healthcare for Public Health, and you had like the Harvard School of Public Health instead in charge. And so I think we need a different mindset. I'm not saying a different organization because I think it's a folly to say, let's just create a new agency that's going to be a pandemic agency. I think th this capacity needs to reside within CDC, but it needs to be a component within CDC that has a much different mindset, that has much more of a national security mindset. Um, and you, you need to have the ability to do, um, you know, a handoff to industry, to engage industry very early. CDC is sort of very insular. And that's, this was personified with the development of the diagnostic test where CDC didn't partner that work, wouldn't share samples, wouldn't distribute the test outside of their normal um, conduits in the public health labs. And so you, you need an agency that will engage industry right away to do rapid scale up of the components that are going to be needed to respond to a pandemic. And that's what South Korea did. I mean, if you want to see a model of where you had a public health agency leading a, an all of the above approach was in South Korea. And they had put in place mechanisms to work very quickly with their private industry to scale production of things like diagnostic testing that they would need in a crisis. We didn't do that. We didn't have those mechanisms in place. And that leads me to the, the, the second point, which is that there was this, always this notion that we're going to create a warm, warm base of preparedness. I can't tell you how many times I heard that term when I was in the government um, as part of our pandemic preparedness. And the notion was that you build facilities or you'd contract with facilities for capacity and you'd keep it warm. You know, it wouldn't be operating, but you'd be able to scale it up in a crisis and you'd stockpile a whole bunch of components. And I think what we learned in the setting of this crisis, and you saw it with Emergent, and you saw the news yesterday with Emergent, uh, when Emergent was a big piece of that sort of warm base of preparedness is that base needs to be hot, needs to be operating. So you need different ways to kind of contract for what you're going to need. So to take an example with biologics manufacturing, you can't just build a facility and partially operate it because you're not going to be able to scale it up in a crisis. You know, the, the, the most 
coveted commodity is the skilled personnel to run it. And you can't just sudden, make them suddenly magically appear in, in a crisis. So if you want to have biologics capacity in, in a setting of a crisis, you're going to need to pay for basically a call option on someone's existing capacity. So you're going to have to, you, the government's going to have to go out and say, you know what, we'll pay um, $100 million a year to be able to call away 200 liters of biologics manufacturing capacity on three months notice for 16 months. Maybe it won't sound like that. There's probably people on the phone cringing right now who are like, that doesn't make sense. But something like that, you get the point. And, and how would that get filled? Well, maybe Regeneron would bid on that. And what they would, Regeneron would say is, you know what, instead of building um, three reactors, we're going to build five and we're going to kind of rotate them and operate all of them. And instead of operating them at 80%, we're going to operate them at 50%. Or they might say, you know what, we're going to freeze two years worth of our API so that if we need to turn over our entire facility of the government, we can just burn down our frozen stock for, you know, 24 months um, or 12 months, whatever it is. So there's different ways to fulfill that. But the point is you have an operating facility and what the government's purchasing isn't a facility that's getting mothballed. It's, it's purchasing a, a call option on an operating facility on something where the, the personnel are in place and it's ready to go. So that's a that's a hot base of preparedness, and that's how we're going to need to think about pandemic preparedness in the future. We're going to have to build, we're going to have to overbuild some of the critical capacity. I'll give you one more example, and I'll pause. Um, we ran out of PCR testing at the outset of this crisis. I mean, no, no one, no one ever envisioned that we'd have a pandemic with a coronavirus. We always thought it would be a flu, and the installed base of flu tests in doctors' offices would be sufficient in the setting of a pandemic flu. Suddenly, you needed to collect respiratory samples and do PCR testing. Well, if you look at the big labs like Quest and LabCorp, they'll operate sophisticated machinery at 80% capacity. They'll have you know 3,000 machines running at 80% capacity at a high-complexity lab. Maybe they should be running 5,000 machines at 50% capacity. So now they've got some built-in capacity. They've got an operating lab with the skilled people there to run it, but they have some residual capacity. They're not operating anymore for maximal efficiency. They're operating for maximal resiliency, and they're getting paid to do that. There's a the government's contracting with them to do that. I think those are the ways we need to think about pandemic preparedness in the future, creating that hot base of preparedness. Thanks for that. That's actually a fascinating perspective. And I think one that probably the industry in general, we constantly struggle and, and discuss. So I think that's really helpful context to be thinking about extra capacity. Uh, Scott, this has been an incredibly engaging conversation, as always, a, a great pleasure. So I want to thank you for that. And I want to open it up now to Molly to uh, invite questions from the audience. Thank you, Scott and Daniela. It's been a great conversation. And um, we only have time for you know one to two questions from the audience, but um, let me just jump in. And uh, <clears throat> Scott, outside of the U.S., are there specific geographies you see focusing on innovation within the biopharma industry, and how do you see this impacting the market both now and in the future? Yeah, look, I, I think that there's a lot of uh, innovation going on all around um, the world, and and I think a lot of different parts of the world are recognizing that. Um, you know, building a vibrant life sciences sector is important for public health reasons. It's important for economic development. So, um, you know, I, I, I wouldn't point to any one region. I, I think that you're seeing a lot of uh, vibrant activity all around. You are seeing, you know, one thing I would sort of take note of is you are seeing more venture capital go in, into Europe, European life science ventures. And, and you know, having been around uh, the venture world for, 15 years, I think there was a period of time where there was um, a little bit of a reluctance to invest in, in Europe. Um, it was seen that there was the life science industry had sort of downsized there. Um, and now I think you're seeing governments invest back in their life science industries. You're seeing critical mass of um, skilled personnel and, and, and uh, innovation happening in countries like the UK and Germany and other parts of Europe. And now you're seeing more U.S. venture capital go back into those, that part of the world. So that's that's one thing that I would take note of. Thank you. And I think we have time for one more question. Um, COVID-19 has been evolving quickly. The emergence of new variants has outpaced our ability to keep up on the vaccine side, even with mRNA vaccines, which can be quickly modified to match the current dominant variant. Any ideas on how we can catch up clinically? Could we surrogate mar markers be used to, could surrogate markers be used to assess the efficacy of vaccines designed to the latest variant? Yeah, no, it's, it's a great question because like if you would, if you were designing a vaccine for the fall right now, would you use B1 or would you use B2? 
Um, and, you know, we could pivot to a B2 vaccine, but uh, it would be dependent upon different regulatory processes. You'd have to be willing to authorize a vaccine on epidemiological data and rely less on clinical data. We, we have gotten there with the flu vaccine. You know, we have a, um, an approach where we authorize a flu vaccine on, on serum studies. There's no, there's no clinical data generated because the platforms that we use for the flu vaccine are um, so well understood. And it's so well understood how immunogenicity demonstrated against uh, serum correlates to a clinical response. I think we can get there where we could uh, pivot very quickly to a new vaccine more quickly than we, we are today. Um, and the mRNA platforms allow for that and, and, and sort of plug and play manufacturing. So it allows for scaling up manufacturing very quickly. You don't have to figure out how to grow a new strain in a cell culture. You just kind of plug a new cassette in and all the manufacturing capacity that you've, you've created can be used to pivot to a new vaccine. I don't think the policy constructs are quite there yet, um, but I think we'll get there because, you know, the, if you see, if you look at the progression of what FDA has done is very methodical, it's very thoughtful, and it has uh, um, allowed for um, more accommodation as we've gotten more clinical certainty about the performance of these vaccines. So I think we'll get there. I think we probably won't be there for this year. Like if you wanted to, pivot to a B2 vaccine right now, I think that that would be sort of a late season product. You'd still probably deploy the B1 vaccines in, in September. And then maybe later in the winter, if B2.121 becomes a dominant strain, the existing vaccines don't cover it quite as well as you want. Maybe a B2 focused vaccine becomes a product that's used in a high risk population or something like that. I mean, that's a possibility, but I don't think that the, the regulatory process is going to be um, sufficiently accommodative to allow us to pivot right now. I think what, I think what we're going to be contemplating right now is the vaccines that we've been prepping, which is the, the ones based on B1. Thank you so much. We've run out of time, but um, thank you again, Scott and Daniela, for a wonderful and very informative conversation. Um, thanks for the participation from the audience as well. Don't forget to navigate the event platform and visit the exhibit hall, poster hall, and virtual labs when you have a chance. The next presentation is starting now and will feature Philip Probert from CPI talking about the past, present, and the future of mRNA manufacturing. So don't miss it. Thanks for your time and enjoy the rest of the event.